and without further ado, let me turn things over to Jillian Bell. Thank you, Ben. And Action Camera, thank you so much for having me. Like Ben said, next slide. Um, I am an ex-commercial food and product photographer and stylist. Before my current role at national, as a national tech rep for Tamron, this, this is what I did. I, I worked with restaurants to take menu photographs. I worked with chefs to help provide a portfolio for them. Um, my passion, other than macro photography, is, is food and styling. You know, styling is great. Food and product photography is amazing because your subjects never talk back. It's something that you can just literally and professionally play with your food. You just need a little creativity, a good story in your mind, and a great eye for detail. I also want to stress that you do not have to be a foodie to be a food photographer. I, I personally am not a foodie. I am perfectly content with an apple or a peanut butter sandwich. I, I love cafes. I love greasy diner food, um, not the hip, trendy places. So if you can't cook, that's fine. You don't have to cook. You don't even have to like cooking, but you have to be able to you know, get a story in your mind Try to develop the, the photograph visually before you start building the scene. On our menu today, there's three basic ideas that I want to discuss with you today. And the main goal of this presentation is to give you the tools to make your own photographs better. You know, whether, whether you've found a new love of cooking, whether you want to do this professionally, whether you're just dabbling, you know, at a restaurant and you want to photograph the dishes that you're ordering. Um, these are the three major ideas that, that kind of make food photography and product photography what it is, and um, I hope you get something out of this. Number one, we'll talk about angles and perspectives. So I'll talk about the difference between a 90 degree angle, a 45 degree angle, and an overhead point of view, and how that changes your scene. Number two, we're going to discuss lighting. So diffused light versus indirect light versus direct light. These different things are going to shift the overall mood of the story that you're trying to tell. And then lastly, the fun part, we'll talk about styling. This is going to shift the purpose. Because at the end of the day, we look at photographs for publications. These are going to have a different look than photographs for menus for that purpose. These are going to have a different look than photos we use for commercial advertising. Again, at the end of the day, tell yourself the story, build that scene together, figure out what visual cues you can use to help relate to your viewer what you're trying to tell them about the product or the dish that you're presenting. All in all, it is very important to act fast. You can see really simply in the middle of this screen, at 30 minutes, already my, my leaf of green lettuce has become wilted. The asparagus holds up a little bit better, but time is of the essence. The goal of food photography is to create imagery that is fresh, that is crisp, that is inviting to the viewer to want to enjoy themselves. And so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll put a placeholder in like um, like a cup or um, you know a bowl, maybe a stuffed animal, whatever you have, you know something that you can put in the place of the dish so you can get the exposure right, you can get the lighting just right, you can get all of the different elements put together, and then at the last moment we're going to add the food in as the final element. Salads always get dressed at the last moment. Um, sauces always go on, the garnishes always go on at the last moment because again we want our dishes to look as fresh as possible. All right, let's jump in. Number one, angles and perspective. Like I said, in food and product photography, there are three generalized angles that we will take these photographs for a different purpose. That's a 90 degree angle, a 45 degree angle, and an overhead point of view. You can see very simply with this bowl of noodles that it is going to change the scene depending on which angle we take that photograph at. In a 90 degree angle perspective, this is going to be used to show layering and height. So anytime I'm going to photograph a sandwich or this stack of pancakes, um, a layered cake or cupcake, something like that, and I want to showcase the height of this dish, that 90 degree angle is going to be the one that I will choose 99% of the time. We're also going to use this 90 degree perspective for product work. In in product photography and in displays, this 90 degree angle is definitely going to be used to showcase the label or the brand. You know, in this specific case, I'm showcasing this watch as this is a display. We're going to compare the 90 degree to the 45 degree angle. And in this 45 degree angle, this is softer, 
it looks more realistic. It shifts the purpose from this is a display to would you maybe like to try this on? In food, this 45 degree angle is very, very common. This is what I consider a tabletop view. So if you think about sitting down for lunch or going to a restaurant, you have that plate of food in front of you. The angle roughly that you are now viewing your food on the table is about a 45 degree angle. So I'm going to use this point of view to showcase um, a dish that is very, again, environmental. It's warm and invi inviting. It looks every day. We're going to compare now this 45 degree angle to the overhead point of view. See the difference? 45, or the 45 degree angle again is very realistic. This overhead point of view is a really fun way to play with shapes and colors and backgrounds and layering. Um, in comparison, this overhead angle is much more instructional comparison to a realistic dish that you might enjoy. We might look at this dish as a recipe set. We're also going to use this overhead point of view to showcase a new skill or a technique that you've mastered. And then lastly, this overhead point of view is very, very common to showcase a process or a deconstructed subject. We'll see this very often and I'll show you in the publication section how we can use this in our storytelling advantage. I also wanted to make a note to just the, the kind of lenses that I'm going to use in these different shots. Um, it's very situational, but in the 90 degree perspective, I'm going to usually choose something in between an 85 or a 200 millimeter lens. So the 70 to 200 2.8 or the 70 to 210 f4 is really nice. I'll use the 85, the 90, um, the 35 to 150, something like that. We want more of a telephoto in the 90 degree because I want to create a background that is softer, that is non-distracting, and I can use the telephoto compression to my advantage to help knock out that background. In the 45 degree angle, I'm going to usually choose more of a mid-range zoom, so I'm going to pick a lens somewhere between 45 and 90 millimeters. Again, this is because I want these photographs to look realistic, so I'm going to pick a lens that has that normal focal length, a 45, a 50, again that 35 to 150 works really well. Um, maybe the, the longer end of a 24 to 70 will work. I'll get into the 85 or the 90 millimeter in this 45 degree angle if, again, I'm having a little trouble with the background if I want to help compress the scene. If I need a little bit more telephoto compression, I might pick the 85 or the 90 millimeter. And then lastly, with our overhead point of view, this is going to be my widest focal length that I'm going to choose, usually somewhere in between 24 and 70, because in these types of photographs, I'm setting up a tabletop setup with my camera facing straight down, so I have to have a lens that's wide enough to encase the whole scene. I'll use the 70 millimeter in this case, again, to help control my background, use a little bit of telephoto compression, and I'll show you an example of that a little later on. As far as apertures and focal length, or apertures and shutter speeds, you know, it's, it's all about the aperture for me. I'm gonna photograph mostly in aperture priority with a low ISO somewhere between 100 ISO to maybe 400 ISO if I need a little bit of help. Um, I'm going to gravitate towards an f-stop most of the time of like an f8, f11. Stylistically, I might go a little bit more shallow. If you have the advantage of setting something up and again playing with your dish, experiment with different focal lengths, experiment with different apertures and really get into what your style is and how you want it to look. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're going for. All right, number two, the lighting. Again, this is going to shift the mood. We have three basic types of lighting. We have fully diffused light. This is the softest, it has the least amount of contrast. Number two, the indirect light. This is the one that I find I use the most often, and it has better contrast and dimension, but it's still diffused, it's still kind of soft. The direct light, I will use sparingly, more stylistically, because out of the three, it has the most shadows, it has the most contrast, a little bit more drama in between. And for the most part, my goal with these types of photographs is I want to create shape, I want to create dimension. So I love using shadows when they play a role to, um, again, help create the shape of the product or the dish and to help create separation in between my different layers of, of like backdrops and cutting boards and bowls and dishes and things like that. First and foremost, let's talk about diffused light. So in diffused light, again, this is soft, low contrast imagery. We want an image 
that has even lighting from side to side because we do not want shadows here. We just want a really nice exposure all the way across the plane. We can always add contrast back in after the fact for a little bit better dimension, a little bit more punch, but it's always better to add it back in than it is to take it out if you accidentally have too much. Here's a great example of that. Here you can see I've got really even light from side to side. Uh, this is a three light setup, so I've got one light here on the left, I've got one light here on the right, and then actually there's a little trick where I put a third light underneath the napkin. It's a little teeny tiny LED light that looks like this. I got it at the hardware store. You just turn it on, turn it off, and you can hide it because my background here is a bunch of tongue and groove barn wood. So I've got four slats kind of connected together and the middle one I can separate to put that LED light in between. That's going to um, add better contrast, better saturation to the liquid and that's going to add the drama to the dish without creating a lot of shadows that I have to deal with or um, create a scene that is still very even but it adds a little bit more drama, a little bit more saturation and contrast where I want it on my subject. The other most common setup I'm going to have with diffused light is working with a light tent. We use a light tent because, again, we don't want shadows. We want a really nice, even illumination from edge to edge, top to bottom. Um, and I'll do this with a translucent light tent. There's many different kinds. Um, I'm sure Chris and Action Camera can help you out and find the best one for your budget. I've even, in college, used to make one out of cardboard boxes and like wax paper if I absolutely needed something. But the goal here is to have even light. Uh, the light tent that I use is translucent on side to side, so it's a diffused um, material that I shoot through. I've got two lights, one on the left, one on the right. One is slightly in front, you can see, that's my main light on the right. My secondary light is slightly behind my subject on the left. The background sweep is going to provide a very even, non-distracting background. And then anytime I'm working with reflective, metallic, glass or porcelain subjects, I'm going to tend to use a polarizing filter to help combat those reflections. The goal here is to get it as perfect or as right as you can in your camera because I don't want to do much post-production. I want these images to be more production. I can just take the image, swap out the product, take another image, swap out the product. You can go through many, many different products quickly with a setup like this. Here's a great example of that. Cleaning out my closet looking for antiques. Uh, this is an old salt and pepper shaker. You can see again that light on the left hand side. Draw this in. It's slightly behind my scene. Come back. This gives us that ring light that right here to help separate my subject from the background. And then the light that's slightly in front over here is just going to help illuminate the scene. Same setup, different backdrop. Now I've switched to a black backdrop. And when you're looking for fabrics for light tents, think about a felt, a velour, a velvet, something rich uh, that's going to soak up that light that isn't going to reflect it back at you. Again, it's one less thing you have to heal out after the fact if you um, get fabrics that are not going to reflect that light back in. Same sort of thing. We've got that light on the left slightly behind my subject. That's going to help separate that hand from the black background, the light on the right evenly illuminating that scene. Underexposing this just a little bit, maybe by a half a stop, because I don't care if the blacks go completely to black. I want to make sure that that watch doesn't blow out the highlights, and I get a good exposure on that specifically. Now, when my subjects get too big for a light tent, there's another really easy technique that you can use. Um, it's basically all you need is a window, a hardback chair, and a swath of fabric thinking about a bed sheet, thinking about a muslin backdrop, something like that. And what I'm going to do here, it's still diffused light. I've got my main light source coming from the right, from this window. You can see the reflection in that yellow tea kettle. And then on the left hand side, I've got a white reflector board, literally right out of frame on that chair to capture that light and bounce it back in so I don't have any shadows. Nice, easy illumination left to right. It's more of a diagram of what that light looks like. Again, this indirect light, this setup is one that I will use very, very often. If I need a brighter light source, I'm going to move my chair closer to the window. 
If I want it softer, I might move it further away from the window or wait till a cloudy day. In indirect light, I will generally not include that reflector on the other side unless I need it. Because with indirect light, the idea here is to use shadows and use contrast to create dimension and shape. It's a great method to showcase texture. The natural light setup, this is easy, easy setup with a chair, some fabric, and you know, just a little bit of um, natural light coming in from the window. Now when I talk about this texture, there's a really great example of that. Um, when I was putting this fresh set of imagery together for this presentation, I noticed after going through all of my images that I pretty much light everything the same. <laughs> out, of, out of the end of the day, the imagery comes together with the different backdrops, the different plates and little stands, the, the styling aspects that I use. But at the end of the day, the lighting tends to be pretty much the same image by image. In this case, I have one light generally coming from the left, slightly behind my subject. And then I might have a, right, a, a light on the right-hand side or a reflector on the right-hand side to help even it out. But when we have that light slightly to the left or slightly behind our subject coming forward, it's going to create, create all these little wonderful shadows in the whipped cream that gives it better texture. So anytime I'm photographing cupcakes or I'm photographing frosting, strawberries, almonds, you know, anything that I want to showcase a little bit more texture and depth, that's where my light's going to go. It's going to go slightly behind my subject, usually on the left-hand side. Now we'll compare this one. If I use a front light or a ring light in the same situation, the photograph on the right, basically my light source is coming directly in front of my, of my image. And you don't, get the, you don't get the shape, you don't get the contrast, you don't get that texture in the whipped cream. And so even if you have a ring light or an LED or something like that, I used an LED to create these imageries, the goal, again, to create shape and dimension, get that light off of your camera and move it off to the side so you can work with those shadows and let them work for you. Here's that slice of pizza that Ben was talking about. I wanted to create an image here that showcases, again, you don't have to be a chef. You don't have to be a professional baker or a cook to create good imagery. Um, this is literally frozen pizza that I had for lunch one day. And surprise, surprise, that light is coming from the left-hand side, just window light on the table. This is going to help create better texture and, and definition to all the different ingredients. It's going to separate the pizza from the napkin with that shadow there. It's going to separate the napkin from the pie with this shadow here. Just having fun playing with basic shapes, the circle and the square and the triangle, trying to create a scene. That, that looks professionally done, but again, it, this is a frozen pizza. It's, it's nothing fancy. It's all about the styling. Another technique we can use with indirect light is gonna be open shade. Um, if you're into portrait photography at all, you might have heard this technique or this, this idea, and it's the exact same thing. Um, when we talk about open shade, you're basically outside looking for an area that happens to be in the shade. So it can either be a shady side of a building um, in this case, it's the area under my deck. The, the background is a 12 by 12 slate tile that again, I got at the hardware store. But that light coming from the upper left hand side, you can see the shadows on the onions here, separating it from the cactus leaf, the shadows on the cactus leaf, separating it from the background. Again, I'm creating these layers, I'm building my scene from top to bottom. All right, let's get into direct light. Out of these three ideas, the direct light, again, has the most contrast, it has the most shadows, it has the most drama. Side lighting is always preferred, again, because we're creating shape, we want to give dimension to these photographs. But be mindful of your shadow placement. Good shadow placement can, can make or break a scene. We don't ever want our shadows to be distracting from our main subject matter. Again, we're using the shadows to separate the different elements in these stacks of dishes and cutting boards and things that we have. Here's my first example. Just a fun summary scene talking about lemonade. I'm using a pretty overhead point of view because this in my mind is a story about either a, a July summer picnic or maybe maybe a, uh, you know it's a kid's lemonade stand and I'm writing a story about either the a, you know the the process of making this lemonade or telling the story of the picnic that we were at 
using that overhead point of view gives me the chance to kind of deconstruct this idea. Have the lemons, have the juicer, have the cutting board, all of these little things. And I wanted the, the bright direct light now coming from on top of my deck because it needed to show that it was like a bright, hot summer day. And I think the lighting bode well for that idea. Um, in this image, I talked about those shadows. This one here on the cup is the one that I was the most concerned about. It seems really trivial, but this hard shadow of the cup was the most predominant, and I did not want that falling over the lemons to distract from the main subject. And so what I did when I was putting the scene together is I picked, um, you know, the white plastic juicer, the bright yellow white, or the bright yellow plastic cutting board, the bright cup, kind of set it all in, in this beautiful, fun textured background. This is set up on an apple box, again, on top of my deck. And so then what I could do is literally pick it up and, and move around. You know, I went around in a 360 degree circle on my deck, just watching the shadows, figuring out where they were falling, figuring out which perspective would be the best to take this image. I guarantee my neighbors think I'm crazy when I'm out taking photographs in my backyard because I'm spinning around looking for light, building things in the backyard, never really eating anything, just kind of playing with my food and then going back in into the air conditioning. Here's another great example of direct light. So this is out in the middle of the day, again, using those shadows to our advantage, creating separation between the cutting board and the plate with this nice dark shadow that we have there. The idea with this image was laid back, urban, industrial, kind of hipster trendy, more like an outdoor trailer park bar kind of. Um, thinking about the dish is the simplest part. So it's just simply avocado toast. And the last couple of times that I ordered this, I was thinking back to, okay, what does the plate look like? What was the environment like? How can I recreate this in my own imagery? And I think, I think it worked out really well. Concrete background on top of a rustic wooden cutting board, on top of a vintage um, cotton handkerchief napkin, on top of a, a white plate that has a little bit of personality to it. And then the final step with this, so I, I made a couple of these. It's just simply panini bread, avocado, olive oil, and sea salt. Really simple dish. And I had one on the plate at first before I even put the olive oil or anything on. Again, I'm trying to create those test shots and it needed a little bit more height. It needed a little extra visual interest. So again, thinking back to the last time I actually ordered this in a restaurant, and I remember paninis always have this really um, like hard, acute angle to it, and they're always tented up on top of each other just so. And that was the final piece here. Cutting it in half at that, that really, really sharp angle, tenting it up on top of each other, and then putting the sea salt on, and then putting the olive oil on and then taking those final images. Again, stylistically, sometimes direct light allows you just to have a little bit more fun. Um, in this case, it's a model Porsche. It's about eight inches. It's a little teeny tiny car. And I wanted to take a photograph because I've never actually had the opportunity to photograph a full-blown classic car on, on location. But I was thinking about, okay, if this was a life-size car, where would I find it? What would that image look like? I wanted something industrial, really clean, metallic, silvers, grays, hard blacks, things like that. Um, in my mind, I'm thinking that this is, a, this is a warehouse with fresh cement floors, long fluorescent lightings overhead, really harsh shadows. And I think it translated really well. The lighting here was really simple. In this case, here's the behind the scenes. I used a strip light, again, from the hardware store. You can also use those, those strip LED lights that you use for portraiture, but it needed a little bit more spread. It needed a little bit more diffusion. And so simply, I, I used a shoe box with some wax paper taped over the front of it and, and stuck the, the strip light in there. So I could still get the elongated light, but it was nice and soft and a little bit more spread out. There's the behind the scenes. Simple white tabletop sweep. Nothing fancy there for the background, just really simple. All right, the last topic, let's get into styling. This is the fun part. So again, where lighting is gonna shift the mood of your photographs, styling is gonna shift the overall purpose. Photos that we use for publications, this is gonna be like books or blogs, social media, something like that, magazines. They're gonna have a different look than photos that we use for restaurants, 
And then these are going to have a different look than the ones that we will see for commercial advertising. Photos for publications, the overall feeling here is generally softer, it's warm and inviting, overhead point of view is very common, again because we're deconstructing a subject or showing a process. Think about the vibe or the story that you're telling. It's like the, the more detailed you have the story in your head, the more these visual cues will come into play in your scene um, to help tell the story visually to the viewer. And this first one, really simple blog post about healthy snacks on the road. Um, apart from this time that we've spent here at home, my normal job uh, provides me travel time like 175 days a year. I am generally on the road more than I am in my own home. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to eat at restaurants all the time. I'm going to go to fast food restaurants because, you know, we're, we're generally in transition from one place to another. And that does not bode well for my health over a long periods of time. And so what I do and where I find myself is in these deli counters in the, in the high-end grocery stores. I'll get myself a little charcuterie plate. I'll get like little bits of things. Cause again, my, my taste is really simple. I don't like, I don't like a lot of flair, a lot of accoutrement with my food. It just needs to be simple and kind of torn apart. And so in this case, I've got hummus, I've got salami, I've got green beans, a cup of water. This whole photograph literally revolved around this idea of circles and repeating that shape. And then I also thoroughly enjoy the, the slight color play here between the reds and the greens. I think it's just really soft, really subtle. It's kind of fun. Here's another one. Maybe this is uh, for a magazine thinking about dark chocolate. You know, in this case, I'm, I'm photographing a dark chocolate sea salt and almond bar that I got at the grocery store. And I was thinking about, when I'm, when I'm thinking about dark chocolate or when people think about dark chocolate, what, what comes to mind? What are words that describe this? I wrote down things like warm, satisfying, decadent, dark, you know, really, really just kind of smooth and bitter almost, comforting. And that's kind of where this image came into play. The almonds wrapping around the two bars, creating a softer C shape around the hard squares, really just kind of encompassing, um, encompassing it like a, like a good comforter or like a warm blanket. The dark background comes into play because I needed that sea salt to sort of pop out and I needed a little bit more contrast there. So the dark, the dark background allows the white sea salt to kind of separate those two elements. Lighting, surprise, surprise, upper left hand side. That gives me better texture on the almonds. That gives me the shadow underneath the chocolate to help separate the chocolate bar from that dark background. Took everything in my power not to eat this before I was done because <laughs> they were just so good. Here's another one. Up until this point, all of the light sources I've been using have to, has been either an LED natural light source or a window of some kind. Um, in publication specifically, natural light is very common because we want these photographs to look homey. We want them to look very everyday. In, in this specific case, I was working with a friend of mine who um, is a baker. She's got this, this really kind of rustic farm to table sort of homey bakery. And we were photographing these macaroons for, for fun, really. We were just kind of playing one day. And the idea with this photograph is I wanted to emulate the, the vibe of her, of, her, of her bakery in these photographs. And I showed up with a whole crate full of different um, bowls, different jars. I had a couple small cake stands, something like this. Um, when I'm looking for basic backgrounds, I'm going to find a dark background. I'm going to talk about um, a wooden background. I'm going to have a white background. And then maybe something fun. These are the four basic ones that I'm going to travel with. Because you never really know until you get there what's going to play together, what's going to work together. Uh, the jam jar here came into play because as soon as I heard the, the flavors that these macaroons were, I automatically was thinking jam, you know. So we have key lime pie, we have strawberry shortcake, we have lemon meringue. So I'm thinking fruit, which makes me think of jam, which makes me think of this really fun sort of assortment and, and pile of macaroons. Lit very simply, surprise, surprise from the left-hand side. Simple window light there. Shifting to photos for menus. In comparison to publication photographs, uh, the overall feeling here is generally alluring and delicious. 
the main goal of a menu photograph is to highlight a product or you know, give you visual clues about the atmosphere. And we want to make that, look, that food look as fresh, as delicious as possible so it's irresistible to the viewer and they want to order that. Again, the 45 degree angle point of view is very, very common because again, we want that realistic tabletop view. Overall here, think about the type of store or the restaurant that you're showcasing. And again, those visual clues are really important to help tell the viewer about the restaurant, about the place that they're going to, especially if it's for the first time. Little visual cues, just like the ingredients you choose to use, will shift the purpose. In this case, you know, an upscale restaurant, I'm going to use more of a penne noodle or a fettuccine in this case. If it's more of a family dining restaurant, I might use a rotini, or in this case, an elbow macaroni. Simply by shifting that, that ingredient out gives the viewer a better idea of what type of food they're going to expect when they get there. The overall goal here, again, is to highlight a product or a dish. So in this case, these are mussels. I was working with my cousin who happens to be a chef. And it's really fun to collaborate with him because, um, you know, I, I foot the bill for the menu. So he gives me a list of ingredients he wants. We go to the store and, and, and I, I definitely pay for dinner. But he gets the opportunity to cook and, and be creative in his talents, knowing that I get to photograph it for my purpose at the end. And it's a really fun way to creatively collaborate with, with my cousin. In this case, simple table or the simple chair setup like we talked about before. So this is set up next to a window on a hardback chair with, with a gray muslin sweep. Once I knew that we were having mussels, I was like, okay, this has to be fancy. This has to be like five-star restaurant. So I'm picking crisp white plates. I'm picking like a simple gray backdrop. Um, here I used an F4 at more of 150 millimeter because I just wanted to highlight that one muscle. If I open this up and shot it at like an F8 or an F11, a longer depth of field just flattens it out. I lose the emphasis on one and it just becomes one group texture of the whole dish. Dialed in my exposure and then we added the mussels in. I took a couple test shots and then he put the sauce on and the basil on top and then I took the final photographs. So again, it's a process. It's about building this scene. Sometimes it's about reheating it after the fact because it takes longer than you think it should. But it was delicious at the end of the day. Clean, classic environment here. Um, again, it, we are highlighting the product. It's less about what's going on in the background. It's more about the dish that, that you want to see in front of you. Um, in this case, it's kind of an eclectic uh, 50s cafe style restaurant. And I know this because of the styling. We've got that, that antique sort of eclectic um, glass setting on a crisp picnic table. You can see the fence in the background, so this tells me this establishment is generally outside. Love the lemon wedge, just simple, classic, creating that sort of just that extra little shape there. Sandwiches, this is something that I love to photograph, especially when I'm trying to hone my skills or just I want to play for a little bit. Um, building sandwiches is a really fun way to just kind of get better at your skills and, and plating a dish. Um, in this case, for restaurants, we're using a 45 degree or a 45 millimeter lens because I want to kind of open this up and again make it look a little more environmental. But I'm cheating that 45 degree angle just a little bit to help showcase the height. It's not quite a 90, but it's somewhere in between. We're going to compare this to photos for advertising. So the overall feeling here, it's bold, it's colorful, it's full of contrast. The 90 degree point of view is very, very common here because again, we want to showcase a product. We want to showcase a label or a brand. Um, any colors that are used tend to be in line with the brand. If you ever notice that colors are actually trademarked. So the red Coca-Cola can is a specific hue of red. It's trademarked. Um, Reese's peanut butter cups. I've been seeing a ton of commercials for those with that orange sweep in the background. That is a trademarked color. So if you're getting into photos for advertising, Make sure you're comfortable with setting a custom white balance. Make sure you're comfortable with calibrating your monitor because these little things are going to help make sure that your colors are 100% correct and they are, again, in line with that brand color. In this case, I'm going to use strobes most often because they're going to provide a little bit better crispness, a little bit better clarity, a little bit better contrast than natural light. 
I wanted to compare, we'll go back to this sandwich for a second, in a restaurant type setting, natural light, a little bit more environmental, to one that we use for an advertisement. It's subtle, but there's a difference here. So the colors here are more vivid. We're gonna pick the greenest lettuce, we're gonna pick the best slices of tomatoes. Um, when I'm building this scene, the onions that you see, I needed a little bit extra color, so I just added two little pieces of onions and tucked them in underneath that slice of turkey. Same thing with the cheese here. I wanted a little bit more color, a little bit more ingredients, so I took the little corner of the cheese and tucked it in underneath the lettuce. It's all about styling for the image. If we're talking about sandwiches specifically, the front face or the photo face of that sandwich is going to be the pretty one. We're going to use squeeze bottles to put in the condiments where exactly we want them, so they're not going to smush out where we don't need them in the image. They're going to go exactly where we need. Um, we're going to use things like heat guns to help melt the cheese. Um, personally, I don't use non-edible techniques for my food photography, so if I need a little bit more glisten, I'm going to dilute some olive oil in like a spritzer or use a paintbrush to kind of put it on exactly where I need. I'm never going to use paint to enhance the color. Um, I'm just going to pick the freshest produce that I can find and make it look natural, make it, make it edible. The back side of this sandwich is very plain. I love watching those, 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 those big burger commercials. You've seen them from you know all the different manufacturers, generally on the fast food side, and they've got that, that burger that's bigger than the person's head. They're trying to bite into it. The front of it is glorious. But if you ever make a, a mention to the back side of it, and every once in a while you can catch a glimpse of that, it's really plain, there's nothing there. The bun is actually like coming in on itself because they want all of the ingredients, all of the, the interesting things on that photo face. And this one here. The idea here was a New Year's Eve party, a really fancy luxe New Year's Eve party. I'm thinking Prosecco or Champagne in my mind. Uh, the colors kind of reflect that, so when I'm thinking of a very fancy holiday party, I'm thinking of gold, I'm thinking of glitz and glam. The strawberries in the glass just gives me another visual element, another color to help break up those gold shapes. And then the different um, environmental cues came from the story of, okay, if I'm ever at one of these places, which I don't get to very often, but if I'm ever there or if I see them in the movies, what are the things that I see that I can include? The platter is a really great way to separate the glass from the background. It's also very common to get champagne served to you on a tray. I see beads, I see like garland and things like that. Uh, the lights in the background are just simply Christmas lights that I threw out of focus with a slightly longer telephoto lens and a shallow depth of field. So in this case I'm photographing the scene at 200 millimeters, probably at like an f4, so I can just get those beautiful specular highlights in the background. Simple even light from left to right. So I've got one light here, one light on the other side. These are strobes. But I wanted to make sure that I got this shadow underneath the platter, again, for that visual separation. If you don't want to buy bottles and bottles of champagne, in this case, what I used was simply apple juice and some club soda for the bubbles. It's much cheaper. You're allowed to drink that during the shoot, and you won't have to worry about anything kind of going awry. Here's another one. This picture I've had in my head for a long time, and I'm very glad that I got to create this. Um, in, a, in a studio setting, I'm going to have the spoon clamped down. I'm going to have the bowl just there, so I'm going to have the tabletop on a tripod shooting straight down. Um, in my everyday life, I'm holding the spoon in place. I'm using my image stabilization and holding the camera looking straight down on my tiptoes. Not very studio setup, but I, I'm still very satisfied with the way this image turned out. It's all about those visual cues again. So this is a hearty bowl of soup and the goal was this shape. I wanted the bowl to just really encompass the spoon and, and really fill the frame. The background had a darker texture to it because I'm thinking comforting, I'm thinking winter soup, I'm thinking really warm and inviting and I like the texture on the countertop because it kind of mimics the texture of all the ingredients in the bowl so that's a seamless visual from side to side, helping that spoon kind of pop forward. And then on the spoon specifically, I did go through and put each of those ingredients exactly where I wanted them. That's the main difference between a general photograph and a stylized food photograph. 
I wanted to make sure that I included all the different elements or the different ingredients that were in this bowl of soup. But I also needed to make sure that they gave me good visual lines and they had good balance in them. So I literally was placing those peas and placing the beans just in the right spots. For the background, to get this bowl to look the way that I needed it to, this is where that telephoto compression comes into place that I talked about in the beginning. This photograph was taken more to 75 millimeter versus the 28. Because if I took this photograph at 28 millimeters, you can see the difference right here. There's more separation between the background and the subject. You have wide angle expansion versus telephoto compression. And this is much less dramatic or less dramatic. It's not as powerful visually as zooming it in, using that compression, really allowing those elements to play together. Do you see the chat's been pretty quiet? As a reminder, if I'm talking about anything and you need, you have any questions, you want me to touch back and go back to an image at the end, I'm definitely leaving some time so we can customize this conversation to your personal needs. The last example I wanted to show you uh, was just that classic commercial advertised product shot. Uh, this is something I haven't done in a while, so it was really good to kind of brush off all the rust and make sure I still knew how to do this. Um, thinking about just a simple can of 7-Up. I had it in my pantry. I had lemons and limes in my fridge. It's one of those things where I could set this up really easily. Using the light tent, same way. I've got one light slightly behind, one light slightly in front, but I'm using strobes this time, again, for better contrast, better clarity. The original image looks like the one on the left right here. I didn't add that saturation and that contrast in until after the fact, again, because it's easier to add it in than it is to take it out. Custom white balance, I was able to dial in my lights to a specific Kelvin temperature, and then I set my camera to the same Kelvin temperature, and that way I knew that my color was going to be dead on. The background ended up being, that's the center photograph here. The background was um, a glass of 7-Up focusing on the bubbles, and then I took that image and transposed it on itself so that my, my can had a place to sit. It had a solid foundation to sit on. And then at the end, if you notice, I healed out the barcode right here. I also toned down this little highlight a little bit there too. Because no one wants to see a barcode in a magazine or in an ad shot. If you've noticed, and this is an idea I'll leave you with, um, there were three photographs in this whole presentation. There's been an overarching idea of lemons because I wanted to showcase and show the difference between um, you know, how you can have the same subject matter but simply by styling and lighting and just creating these different scenes you can have a different purpose. These photographs can take on different stories. The one on the left, this is that summertime picnic. This is that lemonade recipe, that, that bright direct light, very fun summery scene. The one in the middle that menu photograph of a lemon slushy beverage here just highlighting the drink as a whole not necessarily how we made that drink but just the, the product and then the one on the end shifting to that 90 degree point of view to showcase the brand to say this is a display um, it's got better color it's got better punch it's all about the brand of the lemon soda i hope you've enjoyed this if you have any questions Definitely we have some time to talk about that here. Um, on a different note, or if you're watching this on the recorded version afterwards, please reach out online. I am Bell Tamron USA on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you guys so much for your time and thank you for your attention.